I replaced my, my, you know, six yep. figure income, uh, within six months of getting into SDRs. What's up, everybody? My name's Mike Shogren here with my co-host, Emmanuel Pani. We're part of a group of specialized real estate investors you've probably never heard of. We didn't start with deep pockets or wealthy families, and we don't rely on 401ks, mutual funds, or traditional real estate investing. In fact, many of us don't even own the properties that fund our freedom. If you ask the money experts out there, they'd say what we do is impossible, yet it's happening every single day. It's happening through a new niche called short-term rentals. We are Short-Term Rental Nation, and these are our secrets. What's going on, STR Nation? Welcome back to another episode of the Short-Term Rental Secrets Podcast. I am your host, Mike Shogren, here with my main man and brother from another mother, Mr. Emmanuel Pani. What's up, B? My brother. So good to see you. Um, welcome back to the cold, cold Northeast, um, as I can tell by your wall. Uh, but congratulations on getting your listing off the ground in Orlando. I'm actually on the Airbnb page right now trying to find it. So I can love it and like it, but I haven't been able to find it yet. But life is good. Lord, yeah, that 100%. Is good always. Market remains crazy, but we are happy and excited. But everything is good. How are you guys? How's the event? I don't think there's any tickets left already. No, I'm joking. Dude, there's, there's still by the time this podcast left. airs, all of the super early birds will be gone. Like we're almost there we've sold we allocated 300 super early birds we're at like 270 or something and this podcast won't come out for another like two weeks so they'll be gone within the next few days um so guys if you want if you want to go to the event which i highly encourage you to do you will be there i will be there uh bill faith our good buddy tj to johnny julie george uh officially just signed uh price labs yesterday mm. as well so they're going to be there get a bunch of other big wigs that'll be down. So it's going to be uh, is coming all the way from Australia. Australia. Yeah. From she's flying in from Australia to speak. So super pumped to have her and uh, it's going to be awesome. So grab your tickets. They're at strwealthconference.com. It's June 6th through 8th in Nashville, Tennessee at the wild horse saloon. The venue is incredible. If you go to the website, you can check it out. We went down, recorded a bunch of content the venue's sick. We're going to have a sweet opening party the first night. And then uh, we've got two full days of content, awesome networking opportunities. Uh, if you're going to be one of the VIPs, those tickets are, it's already sold half of the VIP tickets as well. So those are going real fast. We got the private VIP dinner, premier seating, like all sorts of good stuff, plus some bonuses that we haven't announced yet. So it's going to be sweet, man. I can't wait. It's going to be a blast. So go check it out. strwealthconference.com. And uh, yeah, man, I'm I'm excited. So yeah, let's uh, let's dive in for the uh, for the episode today, though, because I'm excited to bring on our guest here in just a second. So uh, today we have Mr. Kale Delaney on the show. He's got a hell of a bio here. It's going to take me 15 minutes to read it, so I'm going to do him the courtesy of letting him explain all of it. But he's got a bunch of STRs now. Um, you know his his background is. A little different than a lot of people, but I want him to go through it. I love that he grew up in New Hampshire because he's up near me. Um, grew up in a small town up there. And then he moved down to South Florida for college. And, um, you know, now he's just living the dream of short-term rentals. So without further ado, Mr. Delaney, welcome to the show, man. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, E. How you guys doing? I'm great, man. I'm great. So why don't you just give the listeners kind of the uh like the two minute rundown on like your background and then how did you end up getting into short-term rentals yeah sure uh so like you mentioned i'm from new hampshire originally so uh i i know the boston area very very well um but yeah i grew up up there moved down to south florida when i was 18 uh for college and um uh you know went to school for engineering didn't like it started getting a little bit interested and in, uh in real estate and investing at that time. And actually when I graduated, I started work for a commercial real estate brokerage firm uh, in Miami, Florida. And uh, it was, you know, it was a good, good experience. Um, I learned a lot, just really bad timing. Uh, it was 2006 to 2008. And, you know, as we all know what happened in 2007, 2008, things dried up pretty quick there. And, um, 
you know, I, I wasn't in love with being a broker. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I, I did not enjoy the cold calling. I did not enjoy uh, seeing everybody else make the money except me. And uh, so once that kind of dried up, I, I decided to jump ship and, um, you know, I, I started working in construction management, which is what I still do now uh, as my, my W-2, um, just as a logical step from my, my degree. And, you know, I really put the real estate on hold uh, for almost 15 years. Uh, didn't do anything with the knowledge that I gained there. Uh, you know, I, I was just kind of going through the motions in life like I think most people do. Um, get a job, you work, and you hope to retire one day. And, you know, I didn't really have a goal uh, in my life. And that's kind of the reason why I was just going through the motions. And, you know, it wasn't until a couple of years ago, really, in, in beginning of 2020, that I finally got my goal, which, you know, happened with the, the birth of our son. Um, you know, he was two years old now. And it was really that that just got me thinking of, you know, I can't, I can't be doing this for the rest of my life. Uh, you know, I don't want to retire at 70 years old, you know, miss out on all these things with him and just try to live on a fixed income. You know, it just doesn't make sense. So I got to figure out something. And so that's when I just kind of started thinking and, and, you know, the real estate popped into my head again and it sounded like a good idea. So I just dove in with doing the research. Um, you know, I started listening to the podcasts uh, and, you know, every single day reading books like crazy. Um, and so I cemented in my mind that, you know, real estate's the way that I'm going to, I'm going to build wealth for my family here. Um, the way that I'm going to get out of my, my W2. And I started out with the thought of just uh, long-term rentals. You know, I think most people kind of start with that in their mind, at least. Um, it sounds like the easiest. It's what you're most familiar with. Uh, and so I, I made my first purchase, which was local, which was a, a fourplex um, in a little little kind of beach town, not, not on the beach, but a mile inland. Um, but close to where I live and, you know, it was a long-term rental and, you know, we had some struggles with it, uh, in the first few months, but I mean, just with tenants and it was the kind of thing where looking at the cash flow and the pain in the butt that it was, I was like, there's gotta be a better way than this. You know, it's gonna take me so long to get to where I want to be for the financial goals, uh, with just these, these long-term rentals, making a few hundred bucks a month per unit. And, um, so I kind of started looking at everything. I mean, I was looking at residential assisted living. I was looking at self storage, you know, larger multifamily. And it was, it was about six months after we closed on that first deal that I kind of stumbled across, uh, the short term rentals, uh, from a podcast, uh, and specifically in the market that I'm in now, which is the Smokies uh, in Tennessee. And I just heard the podcast. It sounded great. <laughs> I, I literally looked up where the Smokies were because I didn't know where it was. Uh, saw that it was within driving distance and within a few days, packed up the family in the minivan, drove 16 hours out there, met with some realtors, scoped it out. And, you know, three weeks later was under a contract on the first cabin that we had out there. And then, you know, over the next uh, less than a year, um, you know, we, we've got five cabins out there now. Um, and we converted one of the uh, long-term rentals that we had into a, a short term down here locally. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's been a, it's been a, a, a wild ride over the past year, especially. Um, but yeah, it's really been the past two years that I kind of made that, that decision to get going and, and dive all in. I, um, uh, I love that story and I love just how you walk through it. Right. Cause I think, I think one of the things that you said that is very interesting is like, I didn't have a goal, so it's kind of going through. And I think that's a lot of people. Like a lot of people, like they're like, I want to retire and get to this age and then drink my beer on my backyard and just sit on my chair and chill. And they have that vision in mind. They just don't have anything in between. Right. Um, and it's funny because I was like, I knew there was going to be something that came that would have like kind of like woken you up kind of thing. And, and I'm glad it was your your son. Um, yeah. I also find amazing about American in general that somebody says it was driving distance and then proceeds to say it was a 16 hour drive. 
<laughs> in most countries, that is not a distant distance because you would literally leave multiple countries and go into a different continent. Uh, if I drive 16 hours in Italy, I'll go like into, into probably Germany by that time, <laughs> um, which is amazing. You're like, yeah, yeah, we just drove there 16 hours. I put like, oh, I, you know, no, I would not consider that driving distance at all. Um, yeah. But. Oh, Mike is sending my computer audio. Oh, it, it was it was not a fun drive. I'll put it that way. I don't like long drives. <laughs> yeah, I don't mind it. We just did the drive from Boston to Florida. A oh, really? Ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, we did it just because it was around Christmas, and all the flights okay. kept getting canceled because of COVID. So we we're like, we're not even going to chance it. We're just going to we're going to drive mm. to town. Yeah. Um, so what does your team look like? So you you live in Florida, and I know that you live in Florida because Nate. Uh, uh, Kale actually came to our real estate meetup a month ago, right? Is that when I first met you? Yeah, yeah, it's about a month ago. So he randomly walked into our our real estate meetup, and he's like, "I do vacation rentals in the Smokies," and obviously, like, I I get excited if there's anybody else that says they do vacation rentals. Um, <laughs> so, what's your team like? You're in Florida now. I know you don't drive 16 hours for every every turnover up in the Smokies. I just I hope not. Right. Um, so what does the team look like? What's the infrastructure? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I, I self-manage uh, everything, uh, you know, short terms and the long terms. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the the good thing about short terms is is you do need a team, but you don't need a huge team. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, it's really your handyman and your cleaner. Uh, those are the two key partners uh, that you need on your team. Um, so, you know, I've got I've actually got two cleaners that I use out there um, just to have, uh, I guess, a, a backup in a sense. And, you know, five cabins, it's not a ton, but it's enough that um, it's good to have somebody just because there's a high rate of turnover with cleaners out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we have two, two sets of cleaning teams uh, and then a handyman uh, that we use as well. And then mm -hmm. down in Florida, same thing. You know, I have a, a cleaner. Um, that actually trained because they, the Airbnb is not really that big in that market that I'm, that I'm in down here. Um, there's a few, but not many. And so finding a cleaner who actually knew how to do a short-term rental clean, uh, was very difficult. So I got lucky mm -hmm. though and found someone that I could train and they're, they're awesome. Um, so yeah, it's really a handyman and the cleaner. And then of course, uh, the software tools, uh, those are critical, you know, your project Love it. property management could you, systems. Could you walk through what that, what your uh, technology stack is? Yeah. So uh, I use Hospitable uh, for my PMS. Uh, and then I use Price Labs for my dynamic pricing tool. Um, and then I, I list on uh, Verbo and, and Airbnb. Um, but yeah, Hospitable and, and Price Labs are, are the key pieces of software. I mean, mm -hmm. they do. I mean, they they allow you, like you guys know, I'm sure they allow you to automate 90% of, of everything, uh, which is yeah. key. Uh, you know, on the front end of being able to get everything automated, especially with your, your messaging, your syncing of calendars, your yeah. pricing. Um, so yeah, those are really the key tools that I use. And that's and, perfect, man. And you still have your, your, your W2 job, right? As right. Well. Yeah. So that makes a big difference too. Yeah. And that's a yeah. big misconception I think for a lot of people, right. Is like, it sounds like a lot of work and like E and I talk about it all the time and you're alluding to it again. Like you've got five cabins in another state plus one in your state. You still have a full-time W2 that I'm sure is pretty demanding as a construction manager, like right. a lot going on with that. I found at least for me, once I hit, I was able to do exactly what you did. Same exact tech stack till I hit like eight listings. And then I need to start bringing on some part-time like virtual assistant help. Cause then right. it starts to compound. But like, even at five, five, six listings, like you can make some serious money with just that number of listings, especially in some of the markets that you're in. So it doesn't yeah. take a lot to really stack it up. I mean, five long-term rentals, it's maybe you're big. netting a thousand a month, 1200, right. 1500. If you're, if you're lucky, I wouldn't right. see what market you're doing in the long-term right now and, and getting that kind of money. <laughs> no, I'm saying for the portfolio. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Overall. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry. Portfolio. I thought Where each, you I'm like, yeah, you're that. crazy. There's no, <laughs> no, 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 no. In Florida, you get 150 bucks. Maybe. Right. Maybe. Yeah. That's know. what I'm saying. So for the whole yeah. portfolio where you can do that and more with each unit is a short term right. rental. So. Right. Yeah. That, that blew me away, really. I mean, uh, you know, 
I'm, I'm a very conservative and, and frugal person to begin with. And, you know, when I underwrote my first cabin out there, uh, and especially being new to the market and the SCR game and everything, you know, I, I went with the lower end of the projection that, you know, my realtor told me, uh, you know, I should expect. And, you know, it was a, I bought it as a four bedroom cabin, you know, just kind of give an example. Um, and uh, I, I underwrote it to gross 85,000 a year, um, you know, which the projected revenue was, you know, kind of 80 to a hundred. Right. So I put it on the lower end and begin or middle of February, we was the one year mark uh, for that cabin and it grossed uh, 143,000. Oh. Uh, yeah. Which, you know, there, there was, there was some strategy involved with that. We actually, we, we converted, it had a big two car garage. Uh, so we actually converted uh, a bit from a four bed into a six bed cabin with a, a theater room, um, mm -hmm. which, you know, was probably the smartest thing I, I ever did. <laughs> uh, so that was, that was big, of course, and, and bulking up that revenue. But um, I mean, the cost of that renovation was, was, you know, nothing. I mean, in one year, uh, that cabin has paid for itself. So right. it's pretty amazing. I love that. Yeah. One thing I, I wanted to ask you a little bit, just cause you're heavily focused on the Smokies, how a lot of people were concerned because there's a lot of people going into that market. What has been your take over the last call it 12 months since it, I feel like it really started heating up the last like 12 to 15 months. Like what's your experience been? Clearly your bookings are doing well. So yep. I'd love to hear that like from you. It's like, has that impacted you at all? Or have you noticed anything on that? Yeah. I mean, the, the prices are skyrocketing like crazy out there. Um, it, it, primarily over the past six to nine months. Um, and, but I mean, I, it, there's still, you know, you see that and you say that and you hear that, but there, there's still deals out there. You know, I don't care where you look, there's, there's deals. If you're patient and you do your due diligence. Uh, I mean, we just closed on our last one, uh, the end of January. Um, mm -hmm. so, you know, which I plan on doing a cash out refi, uh, you know, in six months and I should be able to get all my money out, you know, so being it again with $0. Um, so yeah, I mean, the prices are skyrocketing and, and the thing you really got to be careful with, especially in these, these really super hot markets like that, uh, is because you get into these bidding wars on these, on these properties, you know, when they first come out on the market. I mean, it, it's a feeding frenzy, literally, uh, you know, within 24 hours, there's multiple offers, you know, 10, 20, 30% over asking. And if you get caught up in that game and you don't have discipline in it, you know, it's easy to get caught up into that and, and really overpay. And I'm not into that. So, you know, my strategy really has been looking at deals that have sat on the market uh, for at least a couple of weeks. That's how I've gotten, you know, three out of the five cabins. And then the other two happened to be uh, off market deals that um, the, the owner of the first cabin I bought, uh, their family owned the two next door cabins and they wanted to sell them. So kind of got a little bit of a package deal, but the other ones, yeah, I, I look at ones that are, you know, kind of stale. And as long as there's nothing wrong with them, you know, if I see good potential with them, those are the ones I go at. And so I've actually gotten all my cabins for under asking, uh, mm -hmm. which is, kind of unheard of <laughs> in that especially yeah. especially nowadays and i'm very curious because it sounds like the smoke is, is very similar to south florida right so yeah. when you see those cabinets there's this cabinet sorry those cabins <laughs> they have you can tell i'm from florida my like, cabinets what uh those cabins <laughs> have been sitting for longer what what is what is kind of typical there like do they overprice in the beginning or or they're just not well taken like no nice pictures what did you see like how do you identify it now? Like, do you have kind of like a recipe? Right. It's all of the above. Uh, yeah. I mean, if, if they don't have professional photos, I love it. You know, uh, that means that it's probably a lot nicer than, than it looks. Um, you know, if it's uh, a little bit out of the box in the sense of like, for example, the Smokies market, kind of the rule of thumb is as long as you're 20, 25 minutes from downtown Pigeon Forge or Gatlinburg, you know, that's kind of the target area to, to find a property. All of mine are kind of right on that edge, you know, 25 minute mark, uh, you know, some, a couple, a little bit, a little bit further than that. So, you know, I don't, I don't look for just the, the, you know, 
cookie cutter ones that are in the resorts that are right near the strip, you know, I'm okay with going a little bit out outside of the box there. And, uh, I mean, like I said, they, they perform just as well, uh, if not better. So, you know, just, just be willing to look for what everybody else is not looking for. Um, and just because it doesn't have good pictures or, uh, just because it's sat doesn't mean there's something wrong with it. You know, um, mm -hmm. if it is overpriced, you know, so what, you know, that when it's sit been sitting, make an offer, what, what, what it's worth to you, uh, and see whether, see whether they take it or not. So that, that's been my strategy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you, that, that, sorry, go ahead, I was just gonna say, are there certain things that you've noticed that help him help your property stand out? You know, I think a lot of properties, they kind of standardize and when they go to upgrade, maybe they throw in a jacuzzi or something like that. But are there any things that you guys are doing that help you stand out uh, in the Smokies in general? Yeah. You know, not, not specifically, you know, the, the, the Smokies market, at least in my opinion, it, it's, it's very, well, there's all sorts of the spectrum, right? I mean, the, most people will fall into the, the mid range, right? And then you're going to have some that are just these like over the top cabins that, I mean, just insane. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. just super luxury, super top quality. Um, you know, mine, mine are really middle of the road, honestly. Um, they're, they're not, uh, you know, super fancy finishes and, and that type of thing. But I think what they do provide is that, um, which I alluded to earlier that, you know, they're, they're outside of the main areas is that they're, they're private cabins they're in nature, you know, they're, you know, we have all different sizes too, from, from studio cabins to, like I said, a six bedroom. Um, and I think we kind of gear them more towards family. Uh, you know, even the decor is not over the top, uh, or anything like that. It's more kind of homey, uh, mm -hmm. type. And, you know, some people look at it and say, mm, you know, you should upgrade that. But honestly, we've had comments about people, you know, they love it because, it really is like a home away from home, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, so, you know, I think that, and then I'm probably a little more hands-on, uh, than a lot of other people too. Um, you know, you can be set it and forget it, uh, a bit with STRs, uh, if you want, but if you really want to maximize things, um, you know, I think you got to be a little bit more hands-on. And so I probably put a little bit more time into them, uh, and managing them than, than I really need to. Um, but, you know, I, I, I touch my listings daily, whether that's checking my pricing, you know, maybe tweaking a title or, you know, tweaking a description or you know, communicating with guests. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think that hands on portion and being a little yeah, bit more yeah. active uh, has helped me kind of maximize the revenue on mine a little bit. Are you are you on any other platforms yeah. or just Airbnb? Just Airbnb and Verbo. OK, yeah. Yeah. And uh, have you noticed like what what do you think like ballpark the split is? I know the bulk of mine come from Airbnb, but we got yeah. some. Yeah, same here. Uh it's probably 75-80% Airbnb. Um and it, it it changes. I mean, you know, for whatever reason, you know, some some seasons will get a slew of verbo bookings and you know, like right now, uh it's kind of the slower season, it's starting to ramp up a little bit, but it's probably 95% Airbnb, you know, for, for whatever mm -hmm. reason. So, yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I've tried adding in some things, uh, that, you know, other, I don't see at other cabins, but, you know, honestly, at this point, I don't think they've made much of an impact. Like, you know, I even added a Peloton bike to one of the cabins. Um, and, uh, I actually took a tip from, uh, from, this uh, this podcast right here, when when Bill Faith was on, when he was talking about his uh, his coffee stations, that uh, <laughs> I just actually this morning we installed a coffee station at uh, one of our cabins. So we'll see how that how that works out. So you know, I try to take tips and, and learn from what other people are doing as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Trying to implement those things. What I what I love about you, and and this is one of the things that hit me when you were talking at the meetup as well, is that you have this very humble way of like kind of like expressing and presenting yourself yeah. and it's very it's very um it's actually to me i've realized over time that to me is a telltale sign of somebody that is successful is going to be hugely successful 
right? Because to me, actually, the humbleness of being open to feedback and being open to criticism and being open to like tweaking your things and going there and putting like attention to your things, it's part of being successful and understanding that like if you want to grow a beautiful garden, you got to go outside every day. Right. No matter right. like what happens, right? Because the garden can be fine a day, but then you don't go for two or three days and things happen. And then usually you can fix them. But then over time, the more time you spend, there may be a key thing that happens that you don't realize. They'll mess up the entire thing, right? right. So they got to be like a, a humbleness into like understanding like and loving the process, right? And I think that's another thing that I've realized over time. The people that I like and respect and that I look up to in any business, there is this love for the process. There is this love for the working on the business, but in the business too. There is this understanding of the business from such a like holistic kind of way that that's why the business works, right? Like it's like me, like I've done every aspect of my business and I pour love into every aspect of it okay. and it works, right? So like you got to look at it this way. Um, but what I wanted to kind of take us to is the mindset switch that you had when your son was born. Because I think okay. a lot of people have kids, right? Like this is a thing that happens every day, but not a lot of people are actually able to have that moment, have the realization of like, I have to provide for him or her now, and I want to be there and I want to be present. I need to make a change. Right. So what did that kind of look like? How did you have that conversation with your with your wife or significant other? You were like, hey, I know, I know we don't know anything, but I'm gonna buy a cabin in the smokies. What was that like? <laughs> right, yeah. Um so it kind of it kind of goes back to just my my upbringing a little bit in that mm -hmm. um you know i've uh it, which you know why, why i love listening to you guys too is because you know i didn't come from money uh you know i was not one born with a silver spoon you know i went through the hard knocks and uh you know came down to south florida on my own and uh you know so I, i've gone through the paces and, and built you know my career you know my w2 career uh, you know, clawing up the corporate ladder and doing all that stuff. But, you know, my, in the back of my head, I, I've always been, you know, very fiscally responsible, um, just in the sense of what to me was common sense, you know, in terms of saving money, uh, you know, investing, which, you know, was primarily in the stock market over these years. Um, and, you know, living below your means, always having kind of a side hustle and, and that type of thing. So, you know, over the years, I, I'd set myself up at least with a, a decent financial basis. Um, and then, yeah, when my son, my son was born, um, it was, you know, it just kind of did a 180 on my entire life, uh, even with schedule and everything. I mean, uh, you know, I go to the gym every day, so that's an important thing for me. And so, you know, once he was born, I couldn't, I couldn't go in the evenings anymore. Uh, so, you know, I started getting up at, you know, four 30 in the morning and doing my stuff and going to the gym, you know, before work and everything. Um, and you know, if, if you have kids, uh, especially with your, your first one, I, I think it's always special and, and you get a bond and, you know, when, with COVID going on and everything, um, you know, I started working from home a little bit too. Uh, and it was just hard and it, it still is hard. And that's why I'm very eager to get out of my W2, <laughs> but it's hard, you know, when, when you're there and you see him and he, he wants to spend time with you and you got to kind of, you know, push him away because you got to take a call or you got to do this or that. And it just, it kind of kills you, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I was just like, look, this, and not only that, and I guess add into the story is that <laughs> about a year earlier I had gotten married and uh, my wife has two two kids as well from a previous marriage. So, um, you know, I, I had gone from single to married with three kids in a span of uh, like a year, mm -hmm. uh, which was a lot to take on. And so again, when he was born, I just said, all right, again, something needs to change here. I don't want to live like this. Um, and so I just said, 
something's got to change and I've got to do something. And I just didn't know what that was. And that's why I started listening and reading books. And honestly, it was the rich dad, poor dad book that, that really was the final nail in the coffin for me. And, you know, once I read that, it just kind of made clear, I guess, all these, these streams of thought in my head and, and just mm-hmm. said, okay, the key is not living this corporate life and being an employee. The key is being an entrepreneur. The key is investing. I know a little bit about real estate, you know, let's, let's dig into that. And, um, so that, that was really the, the switch that went off in my head. And then from there, it was like, I see potential, I see the path how fast can I do this? And so that, that's why I just took off to the races with this. I mean, from, from that day that I made that decision, I literally was all in. I mean, I was on Zillow every single day. I had my realtor's license as well in Florida. You know, I was on Zillow every single day, the MLS, I was calling, I was making offers. I mean, and walk, I, I was literally walking that local market that I picked, you know, pushing the baby in a stroller walking every single street. <laughs> you know? And um, so, yeah, I, I just, again, I just went all in. And um, once we got that first property under the belt, it kind of smooths out a little bit of those jitters that you have when you're first getting started and you get that bug. And, um, you know, thankfully, like I said, I had that financial basis um, from all these, all these previous years that I was able to really just, just move fast and, and scale you know, pretty quickly mm-hmm. here. So, this um, is a perfect example of what he talks about in Think and Grow Rich, right? The first step is having the burning desire. Right. And that's that's a perfect example of it. Like people are people hit up Ian e and I all the time about like I want to get started in short-term rentals. And I ask them, I'm like, so is it a must or is this like a nice to have? Right. Like, are you committed or is it or not right because it's different like you said like when you go all in and you're like i'm going to do this right i am going to change my life i will be uncomfortable at some point but i will find a way and i will make this happen just that mindset shift is so key to like look at in the last like two years like how far you've gone right and you still have some long terms right i think you have like 10 or yeah. 11 properties total so yeah we have like, 11, yeah we have 11 units total yeah so So like that's what i mean man it's like once that fire is lit and you just keep the flame going you're off to the races and it can happen really quickly right yeah that's a really good point about you know is it a a a must or a nice to have i mean you're absolutely right um because yeah i mean for me it was it was a must that you know i i could not stand to see myself in my in my w2 job for even another five years another three years you know so Mm -hmm. i it just wasn't an option, you know? So yeah, yeah I, I had to do whatever I needed to do. Yeah. yeah. I remember, I remember going to UPW and, and Tony has that, that exercise. I don't know if you remember Mike, when you went to UPW, but it's the exercise where he's like, he has you envision what would you feel like if you were in the same situation that you're now a year mm-hmm. from now and the same situation you're now three years from now in the same situation you're now in five years from now. Right. And even as I'm saying that, like I'm getting like <laughs> the good on my, on my arm. Right. Because it, it's really like it helps you understand that it's like and, and I think there is so much going on in life that it's so easy for you to just kind of go through the motions. Yeah. And, and th- there has to be that moment where you just kind of like grab life by its horns and you're like, OK, wait a second. Like. I need to do something like I am not happy. I'm not fulfilled. This is happening. And the moment really, and it sounds super, like super cliche. And like, I know that sometimes people listen to this and especially if you're in like a hard spot in your life, I understand that the words are easy to say and you're going through your shit and it feels rough. I, I, I hear you, but the only way out it's true. Like there is nothing else you can do. Like you got to like buckle down, work on the habits, save up, whatever that looks like. Right. But it's just like moving forward little by little. Right. Um, what is the number of units you need to retire from your W2 job? So I, I'm already there. I mean, honestly, <laughs> I, I replaced, I replaced my, my, you know, six yep. figure income, uh, within six months of getting into SDRs. Mm. Um, Wait a second. So, can you say that again? How long do you take <laughs> to replace your income? Six months. Six months. 
Yeah. Right. So going back to the thing that I just said, right, it's it's you're in that spot now and you're like, I hate my job. Like tomorrow yeah. is Friday and I can't wait for Friday because I hate my life and I need the weekend. <laughs> Kale was in a similar situation, buckled down six months, guys, six months is 181 days. It's nothing in the blip of your life. Mm -hmm. It's a blip like it's literally going to happen so fast. Yeah. Like how fast did the last six months happen? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, and it's, uh, you know, I'd started out again when I started out with the goal with LTRs. I mean, I, I, I had set a, a three to five year plan. That was my that was my yeah. plan of how long it was going to take me to get to the income goals that I that I needed or that I yeah. wanted. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, like I said, from that time I got into SDRs, I mean, it just it blew that out of the water, which was which was you know mind blowing. Um, so yeah, I mean, financially, I'm at that point. Um, you know, we've got some some you know personal challenges that are kind of preventing me from from uh, you know Life. being able to quit the job right now. But mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're still hoping. Uh, I'm still hoping to be able to do it this year. Um, so we'll see how things kind of pan out, but, um, yeah, from the financial perspective, it's, it's, it's there. So it's just a matter of getting the rest of things in order. So. And I want to highlight what you just said <clears throat> and not to, to prod or whatever, but I've, there's a ton of people in, in our mastermind that have ended up leaving their jobs, but almost all of them required me to kind of kick them in the ass to leave <laughs> because they hit the goals that they set. But then it's like, yeah, but I could just keep going. But then I'm like, but why did you start? Right. Like what was, what was that? And there's obviously other reasons and things like that, but I went through the same thing. And my mentor took, I took my mentor out with uh, my wife one night and she kind of put us on the spot and she's like, so what's the date? Like you hit your number. So pick a date and I'm going to hold you to it. And uh, it was, it was an interesting conversation, but, um, if you're listening and you put in the work and you have that burning desire, you're going to get to that point. Just like Kale is where like you've replaced the income and some most likely. And then it's like, all right, am I, am I going to step into this new identity of a full-time right. investor? Right. And that, that mental shift is big, just like yeah. becoming a dad for the first time. That's a big shift. It's a whole new identity. And, um, it's just stepping through that fear barrier and just embracing it and just, you just do it. Yeah. And then when you do, you're like, you can never look back. <laughs> like I, yeah. I could never go back. You're absolutely right. I mean, it, it, what you said about the mindset shift just to uh, a new identity. I mean, it, it, because especially if you've been in the W2 world for, for a while, I mean, yeah, that is, that is who you are. You know, when somebody asks you, you know, who you are, you meet somebody or whatever, what do you do? What do you tell them? Right. You tell them your, your job. Uh, that that's your natural instinct. Right. So it, it definitely, and I, I'm kind of in that stage too, where I'm, I'm still trying to force myself to, you know, when somebody asks me what I do to force myself to not say I'm, I'm in construction, you know, but I, I'm in real estate, you know, I'm, I'm a real estate investor. So mm -hmm. it, it's not natural for me yet. <laughs> you know, Keep going to ease meetups. So kick you in the butt. He did that for me for like six months till it finally Good. became second nature to say that. <laughs> right. Good. That's yeah. That, that's what I need. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, our, our, you know, um, you know, the only, yeah, the only thing is, is we're just, like I said, we're trying to get some other things in order, you know, it has to do with some, some medical challenges, um, and, and insurance and all that stuff. But, you know, hopefully that'll clear up here in the next few months. And, uh, you know, yep. I was hoping to be able to leave by this summer. So that's, that's what we're working towards. But, and, and obviously, man, like I, I hope whatever you're working through, you work through effectively and quickly but also i know for a fact that mentally you are in a different spot regardless of the fact that you have those challenges right because that's the other thing for me like the other thing that people don't understand is the beauty of the fact that you can continue to do what you've always done if you want to mm -hmm. but the beauty and the gift of this industry is that it gives you that little red card that you can put in your back pocket that the moment you're like i am over your shit whoever that is right is it your <laughs> boss is it the job is it the commute is it whatever it is right you can be like you know what i've been holding on to this thing in my pocket for the last six months here you go right. i'm ready right but that journey those last six months 
become completely different because you don't have attachment. You don't have attachment. And I feel that way when I go to like meet somebody for like a, a, a listing, right? I'm like, I want to do a good job for you. You want to hire me? Great. You don't want to hire me? I don't need you. Right. How many people can say that in a job to anybody? And how much power is in that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's huge. Uh, that's huge. That's and, uh, you know, and, and I just want to kind of jump back a second uh, as well and just say that um, or reiterate, I guess, that, you know, it, it is work, too. You know, I, I know I'm, I made the statement, you know, I replaced the income within six months and stuff, which I did. But hey, I'll be I'll be honest, that, that was a tough six months <laughs> and it's been it's been a heck of a, a past year. Um, so you got to be willing to get your hands dirty and, and spend the hours and, and put your time in, right. It's not going to fall in your lap. So, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, you know, if you want it bad enough, you're going to make the time. Uh, cause you know, that's another one of the big excuses, right? There's never enough time. And trust me, there is, <laughs> there, there is, uh, no matter what. So it, mm -hmm. it's just, again, like you said, Mike, you know, how, how bad do you want it? Yeah. Um, and if you want it bad enough, you'll make it happen. So love it, man. Love it. Well, I want to be, uh, I want to be respectful of your time. So before we get into the last question, first, I just want to acknowledge you and thank you for coming on here. Uh, just sharing like obviously all your, you know, experiences, but just your authenticity, like you can just, I can just feel like you're just like a genuinely good guy. That's like, you're on the right path. Like you're doing everything right. Like you've got strong motives, you know, whole family situation, like I really resonate with that because um, I was literally in your shoes like three years ago. So yeah. totally get that. And uh, you're well on your way, man. So thanks again for being here. I appreciate it. I appreciate you guys inviting me. Um, so the last question we ask all of our guests is what is your number one secret to success with short-term rentals? Yeah. You know, I, I was, <laughs> I've been kind of, you knew it was back back. And, I know, I know. And I've been going back and forth all day, honestly, trying to, man, like, I've been, I've been, I told you, I've been, you know, binge listening to your guys' podcast here. And, you know, I hear some other answers on this. And I'm like, man, that's a good answer. That's a good answer. <laughs> I was like, shoot, I don't really have like a real good answer like that. Um, so I guess what I, what I kind of settled on was that uh, be a student and, and learn from others. Um, you know, like I, I picked up, like I said, the thing about the coffee stations from, from, you know, listening to one of your guys' podcasts here, you know, I picked up the Peloton bike thing from listening to another podcast. Uh, I discovered the <laughs> Smokies market and STRs from a podcast. I mean, uh, you know, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. Just, you know, always be looking to learn and, and listen to what other people's are, what other people are doing. And, um, you know, one thing I, I've heard said, which I think is really good is that, you know, success leaves clues. So it's just the same thing. You know, if you see somebody who's doing successful and, and what you want to do, then start following what they're doing, you know, start, start looking at what they're doing. So, um, you know, I know that's not really short term specific. That's, that's very general, but I, I think it's a, still a good rule to follow uh, and just always being open to, to learning and, and, you know, learning from those who are in a position that where you want to be. Mm. And, you know, and I, I, I also acknowledge the fact that you are, and something you didn't say, but I, I want to say on your behalf, you take action. Right. And I can tell from the fact that like you were at the meetup on a Saturday, by that Monday, you were inside the community. Right. And there are so many people that instead would have been like, and this reason and that reason, I have five units already. Do I really need it? Do I this and this? Do I this and that? Instead, you're, you're like, okay, great. This is what I want. This is resources. This is learning. I'm still, I'm, I'm, I'm still a student. I'm going to go for it. And then yeah. with that faith and belief in the investment in yourself, it's worth it because that's, you know, how that's how you got where you are now. You continue to invest and learn. And that's what yield you your freedom that you have now. Right. Yeah. And the, <clears throat> you mentioned, you know, community and, and, you know, that that's, that's huge as well. You know, these, these various groups, meetups, you know, uh, you know, Facebook groups, whatever, um, those are human, humongous resources, uh, that, you know, um, everybody's going to go through the same type of stuff, right? So having a community that can 
help you get through the challenges and point you to a, a much quicker solution or an answer than having to figure it out on your own. I'll take that any day. <laughs> so yeah, I'm big into big into the you know community and, and developing that. Well, grateful to have you, man. Yeah, I appreciate yeah, it. Absolutely, man. Thank you again for being on the show. Everybody else, thank you so much. Have an amazing week. We'll see you guys next week. Take care, right, guys. Hey, STR Nation, if you enjoyed this episode, please make sure to hit that subscribe button and leave us a review. And in the comments, let us know what topics you want us to cover on upcoming episodes, and we'll make sure to get that in the books for you. And if you really want to learn how to launch, automate, and scale your short-term rental business, if you want to go deeper, then check out our free masterclass at strsecrets.com.